everyone. Um, welcome to a Union Chapel webinar. Uh, I'm Jay Richardson. I'm the organ scholar at Union Chapel. And uh, this series is part of our annual organ program, uh, which we call Mixture. And that includes organ lessons, composition and performance masterclasses, um, school workshops, tours, recitals, um, and of course, our annual experimental organ festival, Organ Reframed. Um, you can visit our website at unionchapel.org.uk for more information on all of that. Basically, if you're interested in um, the pipe organ and you're anywhere in London, we have something for you uh, in chapel, um, no matter what your age or your interests, um, aside from the organ, obviously. And uh, if you're outside of London, then um, I am really happy to see that there are some people watching uh, this webinar or this video if you're joining us later. Um, during this um, time of public health crisis, um, the uh, music director of the organ, Claire Singer, uh, and myself are trying to share as many elements of the program as we can online. Um, so in celebration of uh, today, which is the Royal College of Organists National Organ Day, uh, we felt it was the perfect time to launch this series of webinars. Um, we would like to extend our really heartfelt thanks to the Arts Council England, um, to the PRS Foundation and to Spitfire Audio for their um, extremely generous support and of all organ things that we do here. Um, and of course, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, now, before we start, I just wanted to say that uh, this webinar, uh, while it's aimed at people who already use or read or in some way connected with um, conventional um, musical staff notation. Um, if you're not familiar with staff notation, please, please do join us on Wednesday. Um, that's this Wednesday at 3 p.m. Um, right here at the Union Chapel um, uh, YouTube account uh, when we'll be talking specifically about alternative notation techniques. So things that do not involve um, staff notation. Um, and that is uh, specifically aimed at everybody who uh, wants to be able to write music uh, and work with it on paper, but without going through the whole process of learning uh, staff. Um, and a uh, quick spoiler alert, it's not necessary. You don't have to use staff notation. Um, but today we are going to be talking about uh, writing for the organ using conventional staff notation uh, that looks like this. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with that, then um, this might not be so interesting for you, but please, please do join us on Wednesday because that's going to be all about not using staff notation. Um, sadly, today we can't be with our um, Henry Willis uh, organ, um, which we affectionately call Henry. Uh, so uh, we're not here with Henry today, but uh, very fortunately for us, Spitfire Audio have sampled the organ and released a sample pack um, so uh, I'll be using the next best thing. I'll be using the Spitfire um, software instrument. So um, having said all of that, um, we should probably talk about how the organ works in uh, a sort of basic sense. So you can see this picture I've got up here. Um, this is a top-down view of the organ console at Union Chapel. Um, you can see here are the pedals. Um, you can't see the um, quote unquote black notes um, at the ends of these pedals would be around here. Um, but this is what's known as the pedal board. Um, so these are the notes that you play with your feet, um, toes and your heels. Uh, so it's, it's basically like having uh, sort of two hands with two fingers each on the ends of your legs. I know this is quite a strange image, but um, that's basically how it works. You've sort of got four digits to play with um, when you're using your feet because you use your toe and your heel um, on each foot. So that's the pedal board. Um, these three keyboards up here is known, are known as the manuals and that's really um, the defining feature of the organ as an instrument or, or one of them certainly um, is the manuals that uh, you can switch between um, and then you've got the stops over here. Now when you pull all, all of these um, Oh no, they're not. Some of these stops are pushed in, some of them are pulled out. Um, you can see this, I think it's the trumpet stop um, on the swell is pulled out right here. So pulling out a stop will have the effect of activating it and it basically activates a, an entire rank of pipes, um, one for each key on the manual that you're playing. So these stops over here apply to uh, the swell manual, is this one at the top, 
Um, it's known as the swell manual because of the swell pedal, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, this is the grate, um, and it's known uh, that way because, uh, or I presume because it's um, probably the loudest manual. Uh, the stops that apply to the grate uh, have the most sort of oomph and uh, uh, density of timbre to them. Um, if you're playing hymns, for example, you'd almost always play them on the grate. Um, and this is the choir. Uh, this is actually my favourite manual, and the reason it's called the choir, uh, sometimes known as the chair on English organs, is that uh, in quite a lot of organs that are located in an organ loft, um, halfway up the walls of a church or even near the top, um, the pipes that apply to the choir will be located behind the organist in a little box, um, or maybe sometimes a very big box. Um, so those will be the pipes that the choir are able, the, liter the literal choir of people singing um, in your chapel or cathedral or church, um, those uh, pipes are the ones that they'll be able to hear most clearly and first. Um, so that's why um, that is known as the choir, because those pipes are closest, physically closest to the choir. Um, so uh, when you play a key on one of the manuals or on the pedal board, um, it opens up uh, one pipe for each stop that you have pulled out on, th on the particular rank of stops that apply to that manual. Um, Unfortunately, that's about as clearly as I can explain it. It, it. it does feel rather complicated to explain, but I promise it's not that complicated to play. Uh, and hopefully we should um, be able to go through some of your uh, questions or uh, confusions um, in the next half hour or so. Um, that reminds me, please do write in comments to the live stream um, and questions if you have them. Um, I'll see them come up and I will answer them as they come in. So um, how is writing for the organ similar to writing for other instruments? Well, you can basically think of an organ score as a piano score with one extra bass staff for your feet. So if I show you my little, um, this is actually a piece of Brahms that's for manuals only, um, but if I go to my Bach, here's a piece of Bach, starts with a big pedal solo. Um, so uh, all of this is played on the pedals. Uh, don't worry about that, that's just a suggestion for an alternative um, bar to play. Uh, and then you get into, you've got these two um, staves of the manuals, and uh, down here as we get into the main body of the music. So this is, um, these are the, the, the two manual staves and this is the pedal stave. So you've got um, three staves of music for the organ, and that's very, very standard. I, I would expect to see three staves um, in that format about 95% of the time. Um, and you can also uh, notice that you've got your ordinary sort of bass clef down here. Um, you'll almost always have a bass clef there because if we go over to the pedal board, this very top note up here is usually gonna be the F above middle C. So um, when you're choosing which clef to use for your bass staff, you'll almost never need to use the treble clef because uh, most pedal boards don't go higher than that note there. Um, and then you've got your normal treble and bass, uh, obviously depending on what you're, what you're playing um, on the manuals. Um, having said that, writing for the organ is uh, quite different from writing from other instruments in a select number of ways. Um, there are just a few things that organists have to deal with um, that other instrumental players don't. Um, so I thought we'd go over a few of those. Um, the first and most obvious one is having um, the stops to deal with. Um, we call that registration. So if I say registration, what I mean is which stops are pulled out at which time. Um, so we have to deal with registration. Um, we have to deal with the fact that uh, your registrations are going to be different depending on the organ that you're playing um, because all organs have such different collections of stops. Um, you also have to deal with having multiple manuals um, to take care of um, and playing with your feet. And then you also have to deal with the swell pedal. Um, I said I would explain that earlier. The swell pedal is located underneath the manuals at the top of the pedal board, a bit about here, if the 
um, if the choir was transparent, we'd be able to see the, the swell pedal around here. Um, and you just sort of, if I'm using my foot, it just sort of goes back and forth like that. And when you open the swell pedal, um, you're opening the box. And the box is um, literally a wooden box that surrounds all of the pipes uh, that apply to the swell manual, which is this manual up here. So um, all of the pipes that apply to that manual are encased in a box of some kind. Um, and on one of the sides of the box, there will be a system of shutters. And what you're doing when you're opening the swell pedal is that you're um, opening the shutters around the box. So when the swell pedal is closed, it's effectively like having your blinds shut. Um, and when it's open, the sound undampens itself. Um, it gets a little bit louder, but also the timbre changes. You get more harmonics um, because they're able to actually get out of this wooden enclosure that they're in. So um, it's a really cool, it's a really lovely effect. Um, using the swell pedal is one of the most important aspects of being an organist. Um, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, there's a piece of uh, Nadia Boulanger which really uses the swell pedal uh, effectively. So um, to start off with, how do you notate for multiple manuals? Well, um, the short answer is you don't really need to. Uh, most of the time the organist will choose which manual they're going to play on um, and that's partly because different organs have different numbers of manuals. Um, so the organ that I learned to play on had two manuals, um, Henry has three manuals, um, your huge cathedral organs, particularly French ones, will usually have four um, and then you get the sort of uh, mega organs in you know American shopping malls and uh, places like Notre Dame that have five manuals. Um, quite rare to see more than five, um, but it can happen. Anyway, most uh, organs will have three manuals. That's the sort of standard setup. If it's a smallish organ, it might have two. But that means that specifying which manual to play on is really a bit moot um, because uh, unless you're writing for a specific organ, in which case by all means, go ahead, specify the manual. Um, but just be aware that uh, different organs have different numbers of them. Um, the exception to that, and, and one really good reason why you would want to specify a manual, is a particular style of organ writing where you, rather than changing your registration, which stops are pulled in and pulled out um, halfway through the piece, uh, you might actually just set the registration at the beginning of the piece, not change it for the entire piece or the entire movement, um, basically until you stop and take a break, um, and ask your organist to use those manuals as sort of presets that they switch between. It's fairly quick to switch between manuals with your hands. It's not quite so quick to change the stops because then you've got to sort of be doing this movement. So. Um, a really great example of that is Anum Per Anum by Evo Pet. Um, it's set up as an intro and then I believe five or six movements in a sort of um, Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, that sort of format. Um, a mass format, that's what I mean. Um, so there should be a link in the description to this video, uh, which you can go and check out. It's somebody playing um, Pet's Anum Per Anum. So do click on that now uh, and have a bit of a listen. I will keep talking slowly um, to give you time uh, yeah, to listen to that and get past any ads and that sort of thing. Um, we're going to be using actually 11 such links and examples throughout this, so please do go and uh, listen to them while I'm talking. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to sort of pause and sit here to give you time to listen. But anyway, Anna per Anna is a really cool piece. And um, you may notice the organist switching. Um, I'm not sure. It depends on the organist as to which hand they use to do the switching. But they'll be doing that quite often between the manuals. And in the score, what Peart has done is he said, OK, um, you're going to need three manuals to play this piece. Here is manual number one. This is the registration I want. Manual number two, manual number three, so he specifies the registrations for all three manuals. And then in the score where he wants you to switch to a particular manual, he'll put a Roman numeral and say, 
you know, Roman numeral two means um, go to the great, and you'll have a, a key at the start of the piece as to which numeral applies to which manual. Um, most of the time in scores that I've seen, it's choir is one, great is two, swell is three, so it's in ascending order. Um, but really, you can number them however you like. Um, so that is one instance where you might want to specify which manual is going to be played if you're using them as sort of um, patches or presets or, yeah, sort of timbral uh, presets in that way. Um, that brings us on to the question of how to notate registration. Um, different organists will uh, have different opinions about this. Um, my personal feeling is that I always like to see some kind of indication of what dynamic and what sort of ordinary uh, expression marking the composer is after. Um, the reason for that is that if I want to play it on a different organ um, and the composer has specified registration which applies only to a organ, you know, say they've specified viol de more, um, which Henry has, but if I want to play that on a different organ that doesn't have a viol de more, it's quite hard for me to work out why they wanted a viol de more. So if they've written, you know, piano espresso, for example, I can choose an alternative stop if I'm playing a different organ um, that gets close to the same effect. Um, whereas if they've only specified which stops to use, it becomes quite difficult to transfer between organs. Um, so it's always good to have a, a, your sort of ordinary dynamic markings, expression markings, the same goes for articulation, um, things that you would write in a piece of music for any other instrument. Um, if you do want to specify your registration, um, there is a way to do that. Um, I will show you what I would expect to see. So say I am practicing my Bach. Um, and I'm going to write in my registration. You'll never see registration written into Bach, um, just like you'll never see dynamics um, or expression markings in the, in the first editions. But uh, say I were to try and write something like that in. Uh, let's make my text black. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to tell myself to use the Ophicleide uh, at the start of the piece on the pedals. So I'll write uh, Ophicleide, 16 foot, uh, and then actually at the start of that I'll probably write pedal, uh, just like that. Is that a comma? There we go. Um, that's a full stop. So uh, let's make that a little bit smaller. I would write it probably over the top of the pedal part, just like that. Um, so there you go. That is uh, which manual, or in this case, the pedal board, I want this stop to apply to, what stop I want to um, use. In this case, I've used a shortening. Um, and the length of the, the pipe. The reason that you specify that is that different pipes have different pitches. Um, so. 16 feet will be an octave lower than eight foot, will be an octave lower than four foot, be an octave lower than two foot, etc. Um, so specifying what length of um, pipe you want to use uh, will tell the organist what pitch it's gonna sound at. Um, you can, of course, use multiple pitches on the same manual. So to keep going and fill out my registration for the pedals, um, I might also add the principal eight foot um, to that and I might indent it a bit so that we know it still applies to the pedal. There we go. Um, so I would, I may actually just write that up here um, so that I know what registration I'm starting with, and I would write something similar at the other side of the page, maybe for the great and the swell and the whatever other manuals I'm using. Um, so yeah, you, you specify which manual you want to apply to, which stop, and then the length. Um, you don't necessarily have to specify the length, um, but uh, in something like a principal chorus uh, on one organ, um, you might have, say, uh, say this is the principal chorus, you might have three stops labeled the same thing, but with different uh, lengths. So you might have principal eight foot and then principal four foot up here. And if you just say principal, the organist won't know what length. Broadly speaking though, I really wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, 
even as a as a organ playing composer, um, I would only ever specify stops like that if I am either writing for a particular organ and I know it's going to be performed on that organ, in which case it's more of a sort of a performance note to the organist that uh, I know exactly which stop I want. Um, or if I'm specifying uh, a broad family of stops. So uh, to take another example, um, I might say uh, down here it gets sort of rather exciting and rather chromatic. So I might say, OK, I'm going to want to hear that quite well, in which case I'd like some kind of um, some kind of read stop on the grate. So I'll write um, great uh, eight foot read. Um, and then the organist will be able to pick from most organs will have a an eight foot read stop on the grate. So they'll be able to pick whichever read stop they want. Now I realize I've said read stop without explaining what that means. Um, just to backtrack briefly, um, you'll have several families of stops um, on any given organ. Um, one of those families is uh, flute stops, which you can broadly break down into open and closed. Um, open flute stops, if I were to give you an example of what they sound like, let's get up the uh, Union Chapel organ. Um, this is the Spitfire instrument. So um, where is my open diapason on the grate? Uh, there it is. That's going to sound like this. Um, whereas the stop diapason, which is a closed flute, is going to sound like this. So much quieter, more mellow, um, more sort of, that's the sort of thing you describe as fluty. Um, so uh, yeah, those are the flutes. And then you'll also have um, string stops. Bear in mind that um, a lot of the way that the stops are built and named is to replicate the sounds of an orchestra. So the idea of when you're playing full organ is that you would have a sort of full orchestral sound at your disposal um, with all your different stops. Um, so that's why we name them things like strings, flutes, reeds. Um, we don't really say brass, but a lot of the reed stops sound very brassy. So anyway, that's where that comes from. Uh, this is a string stop. You can hear that. It's quite quiet. Let me turn it up. Um, it's, it's really nice and gentle. I, I actually really love string sounds um, on the organ. They're very special. Um, and then you'll have, let me show you what reed stops sound like. So let's get out the trumpet on the grate. It's going to be rather loud. Um, and you also, of course, here is a four, oh no, that's four foot principle. Uh, here is a four foot uh, reed stop, which is the uh, called the clarion. So now I've got the eight foot uh, trumpet and the four foot clarion. They're both reeds. Uh, this is what that sounds like. So, and then just with the four foot, you can hear that's an octave higher than the eight foot. Um, and we've also got a reed stop, by the way, on the pedals. That's the ophicleide I was talking about earlier. That sounds like that. Um, so, uh, yes, that was just a quick backtrack into what I meant uh, when I was talking about different families of stops. So. Uh, yes, you can specify a particular family of stops if you want to in your registration. That's quite a good way of compromising between not giving any registration and giving so much detail that you're restricting your piece to one organ. Um, I hope that clears things up. Um, as I said, do feel free to um, write in the comments or um, email me. I'll give my email address at the end of the uh, webinar and you can email me any questions. Um, as an example of uh, very minimal registration instructions, um, take a look at link B, which is um, from Nico Muley's Hudson Preludes. Um, it's the first movement called Take Care. This is an utterly gorgeous piece. I really love it. Um, and uh, it was actually one of the first pieces that I learned after um, transitioning to uh, a larger organ that I uh, eventually got to play on once I learned a little bit. So um, this is a piece that I'm very fond of um, and particularly because um, you get a lot of freedom in your registration because uh, Muley doesn't really specify which stops to use except for at very particular points he'll say okay I want an eight foot read stop here. 
for example. Um, but the only instruction at the start of the piece um, is piano. And that's really all it needs. And that's enough for the organist to pull in contextual information about the title of the piece, um, maybe uh, who it was written by, you know, um, some of their other work, um, the harmonic content of the piece, the way it contrasts with the next movement, all of that contextual information comes in as well as the expression stop. And each organist will put together their own particular take on the registration um, without necessarily having to be told which particular stops to use. Um, so yeah, do uh, listen to that piece. And then the second movement is a, is really exciting as well. Um, so I, yeah, as I said, I hope that uh, gives you a little bit of clarity on, on specifying registration. It's, it's a complex issue and uh, different composers treat it very differently. In a lot of um, 18th and 19th century French organ music, you'll have the registration specified quite precisely um, because French organs of that period were usually built in very much the same style and they tended to have very much the same stops called to the same things. So it was actually quite easy to, to transfer a very specific registration between multiple organs. Um, but in the organ world more broadly, you'll have a huge diversity of instruments. Um, so bear that in mind. Okay, um, enough of registration. I wanted to talk about notating for the swell pedal. Um, we covered the swell pedal earlier. Um, you might be wondering how you write in usage of the swell pedal. Um, and the answer is you use a hairpin dynamic mark. Um, so if you're not familiar with what that looks like, uh, let me just draw myself a uh, little um, makeshift hairpin here. So uh, it's one of these looks like that. Uh, so I'd, oops, I'd put that below here if I want a crescendo. Um, if I wanted, obviously it would be in black. <laughs> um, if I wanted a crescendo using the swell pedal, I would write a hairpin like that um, below. And then the diminuendo is, is you flip it vertically. Um, so that's how you notate for the swell pedal. Um, really, actually, I just wanted an excuse to get you to listen to some of the Boulanger uh, Trois Pièces. Um, Nadia Boulanger, that is. Um, they're really wonderful organ pieces. Um, a lot of them are manuals only. So uh, if, like me, you don't have a full Hauptwerk system at home or like a, a virtual sort of MIDI organ, but you still want to be able to play it, um, go over to Spitfire, buy the sample instrument, and uh, there is plenty of manuals only repertoire uh, that you can play at home. Uh, I'll actually be playing a little bit of Brahms later uh, using that method. So anyway, um, the Boulanger Trois Pièces are really great. And if you listen very closely, perhaps after this webinar has ended, um, you should be able to hear some very, very subtle um, alterations of dynamics uh, that Boulanger has actually written into the score with hairpin markings. Of course, organists will um, very often use hairpins themselves, um, sorry, use, use the swell pedal um, sort of of their own initiative. Um, and uh, that will just be for expressive purpose. But if you have a particular reason why you want um, them to use the swell pedal in a particular place, then you can specify it with a hairpin. Um, the next thing I wanted to uh, talk about actually was how many notes you can write at once for the pedals um, and more broadly what you can do with uh, the pedal board. So I thought I would um, cheat a little bit and play you uh, the pedal solo at the beginning of this piece of Bach uh, just using my hands uh, on my MIDI keyboard uh, because it's a lot easier that way. Um, and so let me get up a suitable registration for the start of this piece. Um, this is a C minor Bach prelude, so I want something really sort of um, meaty and solid. I'm going to go for lots of 16 foot pipes. I'm going to go for an open diapason there. Um, the Clarabel flute is quite solid, I think. Uh, and I'll use the four foot principle on the grate. No, actually I won't, that might be a little bit too high. Uh, I probably need it a bit louder. Let's go for the flauta dolce. Okay, uh, so, uh, whoops, let me 
get back to my score. I think, yes, that's a good registration. So this is um, just to show you the compass of what a um, organist can do with their feet. Bear in mind, I'm playing this with my hands, but this would all be played using the organist's feet. So their hands are free to do, you know, whatever. You could still be drinking a cup of tea at this point if you are very good at balancing. You get the idea we're going all the way from uh, this bottom C down here um, and a little bit earlier this sort of E flat is the the base of uh, where we get to with our little broken chords um, but you're also going all the way up there um, and this is semi quavers throughout um, I actually played it very slowly just there but if I take off my reverb um, be a sort of normal um, pace to play at in a fairly small acoustic. Um, so do use the pedal board to its full advantage, um, it can do a lot. Um, as to the question of how many notes at once you can be writing for the pedals, um, well uh, the upper limit is really two um, for the potentially obvious reason that you've only got two feet. Although is it? Um, one of the pieces we're going to look at later um, has somebody playing thirds with their heel and their toe on their right foot at the same time, and then something else with their left foot. So they've actually got three notes going at once. Um, having said that, that is quite an awkward thing to do. Um, you can write it if you want to, and it's not impossible. Um, it will certainly be fun. Um, and by all means, I encourage you to do that. Um, the only potential issue is that if you write it for an extended period of time, um, your organist might get hip cramp or um, foot cramp or toe cramp of some kind. Um, it might just get a little bit sore. So uh, bear that in mind. The other thing is that if you're using both feet at once, you can't play legato because you can't switch between your feet. So um, it's best if you're thinking about um, writing that sort of thing for the pedals if you're either doing repeated notes or you're playing very staccato uh, in the pedals uh, and as an example of that um, take a look at link E which is uh, Mein Weg hat uh, Gipfel und Fehlenthaler I believe I pronounced that right um, it's another piece of Evo Pet um, he has written some uh, really lovely music for organ in case you uh, hadn't cottoned onto that by now um, that uses uh, two pedal notes at once throughout most of the piece. Um, most of the places in the piece where the pedals are being used. Um, at the very beginning of that piece you should be able to hear six repeated chords in the pedals um, and then a long gap without any pedals. Um, but as an example that works because you're just playing repeated notes so your feet are just sort of doing that. Um, where there is legato playing with two notes at once in the pedals and you're changing notes the note you're changing to tends to be adjacent, so it'll be like F and G, sorry, uh, C and G to D and G, or you know, um, one one foot is staying in the same place and the other one's moving by just one note. Um, so uh, yes, it's hard to do sort of crazy maneuvers if you're playing with both feet at once on the pedal board, but it is possible. Um, don't let your organist tell you that uh, they can't do it, unless of course there's a, a sort of physical or medical reason for that. Um, I also want to talk about articulation. So um, a lot of composers for the organ leave out articulation. 
um, I have a feeling that might be because you sort of start thinking about it and you're like, oh, wait, uh, pressing it really hard doesn't make any difference. Um, pressing it in a different way makes a tiny bit of difference, but um, not enough. Um, so why would I bother specifying articulation? Well, organists have their own way of manufacturing um, articulation. Uh, it's quite complex um, and I won't go into it now, but as an example, if you want to accent or emphasize a note, you tend to shorten the note that comes before it. Um, so let me just get a sensible registration up for the manuals. Um, and I will show you what I mean. Um, there we go. So say I want to emphasize every second, uh, every second chord, I might sort of go. I might shorten the notes that come before it. Um, sorry, that was a very boring musical example, but you get the idea. Um, now, if you want to write that articulation in, I would say just use normal articulation markings. Use tenutos, staccatos, um, spiky staccatos, uh, you know, anything that you would use for any other instrument. The organist will do what they can to interpret and deliver that articulation. Um, it, you know, you, ca you can't really get the equivalent of a Bartok pizzicato on the organ, um, but you can do your best. Um, and uh, it's always interesting at least to me, to write uh, notation that you would use on any other instrument and that musicians sort of generally, there's an accepted meaning, there's a, there's a shared uh, understanding of musically what that means. To take Tenuto for, a, for an example, um, you might think, well, on the organ, how is an accent really different from a Tenuto? It is in a subtle sort of way, uh, depending on the organist. So um, do give articulation detail, um, it really helps the organist to uh, pull in some contextual musical information about what you're after. Um, our example for articulation uh, is one of my favourite uh, pieces and probably my favourite organist. Um, Link F is uh, Dame Gillian Weir um, playing the ninth movement of La Nativité du Seigneur um, by Messiaen. Um, so go and have a look at that. Um, it's uh, an absolute treat of a piece. Uh, La Nativité du Seigneur is in nine movements and this is the last one. The entire last page, which is um, the link that I've put in the description, has a time code so it will take you to the last page. All the pedal notes on that last page have staccato markings. Um, and you are playing uh, with both feet at once in octaves for, that, uh, for most of that last page. So you kind of have to be staccato because it's quite hard to be legato um, but you're watching Gillian you know Gillian Weir could do it uh, legato if she wanted to so um, yes uh, those staccato markings on the last page that's the sort of manifestation of uh, what the organist will do and what it will sound like um, bear in mind also that if you're playing in a large or a sort of washy acoustic um, an organist will typically separate things a bit more um, so in, uh, in terms of articulation, there's also legato. Um, organists really love playing legato um, and sort of blending uh, and, and gluing notes together. Um, a great example of that is the third movement of La Nativité du Seigneur, uh, Dessin Eternel, um, in which there is a slur across the entire movement um, over the top of the right hand part. Um, and because notes on the organ never decay, you know, I can sort of sit here for as long as I want. And this isn't just the, the sample instrument, it, you know, this is what the organ will do in real life. Um, because nothing decays, you can really sort of get that. Very, very smooth, even sound. Um, so yes, explore legato. It's, it's, uh, it's really great on the organ. Um, and just notate it in the same way that you would for any other instrument. Um, uh, so um, that's Dessin Eternel. Um, there are some situations I wanted to point out in which you might actually write for more than uh, three staves. That would be if you've written for something very, uh, if you've written something very complex for the manuals, 
um, and you need all of that space in order to sort of explain what's going on, um, you might want to do that. Um, another instance, if we go back to the very beginning, I was talking about using the manuals as patches or presets. Um, one way to notate that is to use a Roman numeral every time you want the organist to switch manuals. Another way is just to have one stave per manual um, and you switch across those staves. Um, that's sometimes a bit neater. Um, if you go over to Universal Edition and uh, have a look at the organ um, transcription of Spiegel im Spiegel, um, uh, another piece of pet, um, you'll actually see that uh, that's what they've done. Um, the left-hand part is written over two different staves because it keeps swapping between uh, the two lower manuals, I think the, the chair and the grate, um, at least that's how I do it and I've seen that in performances. Um, that's in, in link H if you want to have a look at somebody doing that. Um, just uh, racing through a couple of uh, more practical things. Um, it's important to be precise about the duration of the notes that you're writing um, when you're writing for the organ because, as I said, nothing decays. So uh, if you take a look at link I, um, which is an absolutely stunning performance of um, the Durufle Prelude and Fugue on Alain. Um, this is a, a just one of the very foundations of the organ repertoire. It's uh, one of my favorite pieces of organ music. Um, the fugue as well is, is just so um, beautiful. So check that out. Um, and you'll hear at the beginning of the Prelude, um, there are some places in the left hand where you play a chord for a medium length of time. Everything else is very staccato. But actually, if you look at the score, Durufle has specified that that chord is five quavers long. Um, you're, you're in regular, um, I, it's four, four or two, four or two, two or something like that. So five quavers is quite an irregular length for that time signature. But he has specified that because he wants it to just hang over the side of the bar. Um, and if you don't specify that, then your organist will lift it too early. Um, so it's good to be as specific as you can about that because you basically you've, you've got nowhere to hide. The note is not going to decay until the organist physically lifts their hand off the keyboard. Um, and as I said, it's an amazing performance. So yeah, do go and listen to it. Um, okay, this is my favorite part. Do you have to write for manuals and pedals at the same time? Definitely not. Um, there is plenty of amazing music that's been written for uh, manuals only and for pedals only, just like there's uh, some wonderful piano music written for just the left hand or just the right hand. Um, historically, manuals only music for the organ tends to be um, the, or most of it is the sort of m medieval or pre-medieval stuff um, that's quite often written for the chamber organ where you'll not really have a pedal board or you'll have some sort of tiny little sticks at the bottom of the instrument, um, which you can play sort of literally pedals with, but you can't do anything very complicated with them. Um, however, there are exceptions dotted throughout history. Um, people are still writing um, great music for manuals only. Um, apart from anything else, uh, it's a lot cheaper to buy a good chamber organ than it is to buy a good sort of fully installed pipe organ. Um, and they they do make really wonderful sounds. Um, so uh, there's that. And also by writing manuals only, only music, you'll give an organist a bit of a rest, particularly if like me, you came to the organ from the piano and your pedal technique is still catching up. Um, obviously it's good to play pedal solos and we'll get to that in a minute. But sometimes it's nice to just uh, doodle, you know, on the manuals, play something, um, play a, a fully performed musical piece with just the manuals. So um, the Boulanger Trois Pièces that I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of that is manuals only. There's also a collection of um, 11 chorale preludes by Brahms, um, of which numbers five and six and eight, I believe, are um, manuals only. So there's a recording of that in link J. Um, I thought I would also, I've got the score, so I thought I would just show you what that sounds like. Um, what I really wanted to demonstrate is that you're not going to have to be compromising in the pitch range of your piece if you write for manuals only, um, because on quite a lot of organs, um, including Henry, um, 
especially, you know, certainly a lot of the, the bigger organs that you'll find, um, you do actually have, as we can see here, uh, 16 foot pipes on the manuals, so they can actually go quite low. Um, so, uh, is this... Yeah, that's quite a sensible registration. I might just get rid of that and add... No, that's the parrot. Uh, I want something a little bit softer. Oh, how about the Vox Angelica? Solutional. There we go. So uh, this is what the start of the Brahms sound like. And what I really want you to listen for is, can you tell that you're only using the manuals? Does it sound like, oh, this is a manuals only piece of organ music? Or does it just sound like organ music? Uh, you can be the judge. get that here. So to me that sounds like um, actually just organ music. Um, I wouldn't necessarily notice that the pedal isn't there and even if I did notice um, my ears might thank me um, particularly if I've been in a uh, space with a really reverberant low end and I've been pummeled with sort of 40 or 50 hertz for an entire recital um, or an entire service or something. I might I might really like to have um, something that sounds a bit lighter, but it, it certainly doesn't sound as if it has a hole in it. Um, particularly if I apply my, my little reverb. You can really sort of um, gel things together. We're very lucky in Union Chapel in that the acoustic we have is superb. Um, so um, yeah, take advantage of your acoustic that you're writing for as well. Um, but that's just to say writing for manuals only is not a cheap option. It's not a sort of way out. It is really a um, uh, just a, a nice alternative to writing for everything all the time. Um, amongst pedals only repertoire, um, one of my favorite pieces is the Mittelschulter, uh, Wilhelm Mittelschulter's Perpetuum Mobile, um, which also just goes to show how much a good organist can do with their feet alone. So that's link K. Um, do go and check that out. That's the end of uh, what I wanted to say about uh, writing for the organ. Um, and notating for the organ. If you have more questions, um, please feel free to write those in the comments to this video. Um, it will stay up online after the live stream has ended. Um, and you can also email me at uh, organscholar at unionchapel.org.uk. Um, and as I said, you can find all of our organ activities um, on the website at unionchapel.org.uk. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you are here, um, please do tune in this Wednesday, 22nd of April at 3 p.m. for the next workshop, uh, which, as I said, is going to be about um, using notation methods other than staff notation um, to really get at things that you can't do with staff notation, um, to make your work more accessible to people who don't read staff notation, um, but mainly to just have more fun than you can have uh, just using staff notation alone. Um, after session four in a few weeks time, so there's, this is the first, there's going to be a, another one next week and then another two after that. After session four, we're going to be opening up a call for five minute compositions um, using some of the techniques that we cover in this series. So that's going to be um, graphic scoring, instruction based scoring, game pieces um, and staff notation and writing for the organ. Um, a selection of 10 of those are going to be performed by our organ students um, at the chapel. So please stay tuned throughout our whole series for more news about that. Um, we're going to be announcing more details very soon. 
Um, and thank you again from uh, Claire and myself and all of Union Chapel for watching today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.